In this last video on teamwork, I'll briefly discuss the concept of team effectiveness. Team effectiveness basically examines how the team, which is composed of different individuals, is actually performing. And broadly speaking, there are three main methods of assessing team effectiveness. First category of measures looks at effectiveness of the outputs, which means these are more tangible indicators of team performance. For instance, if it is a production team, you can look at the productivity, you can look at response times, you can also examine customer service ratings, quality, innovation in the team. So all these tangible output related measures can look at team effectiveness. The second way to assess team effectiveness is to look for team members opinions. And in this type of survey, you can ask team members for their satisfaction with the team. You can ask team members for their levels of commitment or how much trust they have in the team or the levels of cohesion. So all these attitudinal measures can look into teams' emotional or attitudinal states. And you know that these states are known as emergent states. And finally, you can also look at behavioral outcomes such as absenteeism, turnover, or compliance with safety in the team. So all these different methods can tell you something about how the team is performing. And team effectiveness is a very important concept when you are trying to manage teams. And the reason being that it is quite challenging to manage different people who work in a team. The problems can be with either the processes or the emergent states of the team. When it comes to processes, we can see various problems. For instance, coordination losses in the team. These type of losses occur because too much time is being consumed in coordinating activities with each other and therefore uh, valuable team time is lost and you instead of working on the core tasks you're busy uh, trying to figure out how to interact with each other. Production blocking is another type of uh, coordination loss where people cannot finish their work because somebody else has delayed their output and you can see that how in sequential tasks you can face production blocking. In addition to coordination losses, teams also suffer from motivational losses because their interpersonal processes of motivation and confidence building are weak. You all might have experienced social loafing when you are working in teams where you have free riders who think that they don't really need to make as much effort as others. And this is really a uh, big problem when you are working in teams. How do you ensure that everybody is working at their optimal level? And social loafing happens in team situations where there will always be some members who are not willing to exert as much effort as others. In social psychology, researchers have examined the phenomena of social loafing in great detail and we have experiments as early as 1913 to show us that in group settings people don't work as hard as when they are working alone. For instance, there are classical clapping and shouting experiments where subjects are assigned the task of either clapping or shouting and the subjects are brought to the lab and are asked to sit in a cubicle all alone. In one group, the subjects are told that although they don't see anybody else, but there are other subjects in the lab who are sitting in the cubicle just like them. And all of you are part of one group. And as a group, they are instructed to shout or clap as loud as possible. They are given this instruction, but in reality, they are just working alone in the cubicle. Now, this group setting is compared with the situation where subjects are brought to the lab and they are told that they are working alone. They are asked to sit in the cubicle in the same way. And when they look at 
how intensely the alone individual shout or clap they have seen again and again that in the setting where subjects believe that they are working with others they shout or clap with much lesser effort or intensity compared to the individual setting and experiments like this show that in group settings something happens and people do not work as hard as possible now what is the cause of this what happens and there are several reasons the first one is diffusion of responsibility when you are in a group setting you are not the only person who is responsible for the task so therefore there is a certain level of de-individuation going on and you do not act the way you would act when you have the sole responsibility to complete the task so uh, this is known as hiding in the crowd one example is these field studies that have shown that when somebody is stranded on a busy highway very few passers-by stop to help the stranded individual compared to when somebody is stranded on a less busy road and then there are more passers-by who feel obliged to stop and ask if the person needs help similarly in group settings there is lack of accountability the more people there are you can hide in the crowd you're less visible and therefore you feel more comfortable in not making as much effort there's also the phenomena lost in the crowd which is you feel dispensable you feel like you do not matter in this crowd and therefore you don't exert that much effort similarly in group settings people sometimes have lack of challenge and they feel demotivated and less willing to engage in the task and then there's a free riders and sucker effect going on free riders are individuals who in group setting want to take advantage of others they believe that there are others who are working and they don't need to work and because of this free rider phenomena in group settings there are individuals who think that there are going to be free riders and i don't want to be the sucker who does all the work and in anticipation of all this there are individuals who just reduce their effort so free riders and sucker effect together can also decrease the level of effort in the group and you can tie back this phenomena to Adam's equity theory that we discussed in the early part of our class where in social situations you make these comparisons and if you feel that people will take advantage of you you will decrease your input levels right so that's one way to restore equity in short social loafing is something that managers need to be mindful of and they can take steps to decrease social loafing for example by increasing accountability by introducing checks and balances social loafing can be decreased similarly when you have manageable group sizes you can decrease social loafing if you have really big groups for example 30 people working together there is more likelihood that people would feel that they can hide in the crowd and then uh, social loafing uh, effects might be more prominent in addition to social loafing there are other problems that groups also face for example in decision making module ash effect or bandwagon effect is discussed this effect shows that how in group settings people just like to conform to each other and then they make poor quality decisions another problem that groups face is known as group thing in emergent states cohesion is one of the important state of teams Cohesion means that groups feel united and they work together on the task and there is high camaraderie in the group and groups are engaged in their task and feel like they are one unified force. However, at times the social cohesion can increase too much. There are optimal levels of social cohesion. If social cohesion is too low, it's not good for group performance. Similarly, if social cohesion is too high, that's also not good. So there is an inverse 
U-shape relationship if you plot social cohesion on x-axis and group performance on y-axis. And if groups become too cohesive, then group thing is a phenomena that you might face. And what happens in these two cohesive groups is that friendship and camaraderie takes precedence over anything else. And first and foremost, the group members try to preserve harmony and friendship with each other. And therefore, they're not willing to challenge each other. And once critical thinking and challenge decreases in the group, the task is going to suffer. And therefore, group performance will decrease. Ironically, groups who have been very successful, they face group thing. Over the course of time, success after success brings these people really together and they feel bonded with each other. And therefore, they do not have the ability to challenge each other either. They have really a high opinion of each other and they can't really see flaws in each other's argument or even if they do so, they are not willing to risk each other's disapproval because friendship has become so important and therefore such members will not challenge something that they secretly feel that is not right. So this member is engaging in self-censorship and not sharing his ideas. Other symptoms of group thing is strong stereotyping of outsiders as inferior. Similarly, there can be a certain level of self-righteousness about the group that we are always right. So there can be different symptoms of group thing. And once this problem is identified, managers can take different actions to reduce group thing. For example, they can assign current members the role of devil's advocacy where somebody is appointed to think differently and challenge the group about the ideas. If this doesn't work, you can bring fresh members in the group. Fresh barrage always helps and this can break the pattern of group thing. Just to recap, we talked about various issues in group settings that can reduce effectiveness of teamwork. We talked about production problems, motivational problems, social loafing, ash effect, and group thing. We also discussed some mechanisms that can remediate the situation. Hopefully, these will guide your teamwork effectiveness in future. With this, we end our discussion. Thank you for listening.